Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, September 25th. It's a beautiful day outside, and Pete has come this morning to record this, and uh, we're looking forward to this lesson. I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer this morning before we begin. Heavenly Father, we come to you uh, again this morning, and it's just our hearts are overflowing with gratitude for your kindness, for your mercy, for your patience with us. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, for the gift of eternal life, the gifts of salvation and sobriety. Thank you, Father, for our senses, that you've blessed us with a brain and a mind and that you've opened our hearts, Father, to your wonderful truth. Thank you, Lord, for our church and our church family. We ask, O Lord, that you please remember this body this morning, the many prayer requests that you know perfectly. We ask, Lord, that you will fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit, that you will turn a light on the rooms of our hearts that need to be swept out or cleaned out that we might get rid ourselves of the things that are displeasing to you lord help us to put a guard on our mouths for we often speak and never can't half remember what we say remove from us father contempt and fill us with a spirit of love for other people. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would uh, please uh, be over this lesson this morning. That you'll be honored and glorified in the presentation of it. That this will go out and will reach and touch many lives. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're in session four in this uh, new book. We're talking about the Ten Commandments, uh, the beginning of these sessions. And today we're going to talk about honor life. Respect human life as God does. We have one verse from Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, which is, Thou shalt not kill. And the remaining verses are from chapter uh, 26 in the book of 1 Samuel. As I said last week in reading these lessons, they're wonderful. They're little excerpts, so to speak, out of God's holy word. They are given for a a purpose to uh, hone us in, direct us on a specific point that God's word may be teaching. But as I've found, if you can and have the time, read a little bit before coming up to these uh, verses this morning. Maybe read a couple chapters before leading up to these verses. And then maybe even read some afterwards. And you'll get a bigger picture as to what the scripture is talking about the time period, what may have been happening in in, uh, whatever book that you're in. But it'll give you a more solid background and helps me, and I maybe help you too, in the understanding of the passages that are given uh, in the lesson books. I've found I've been blessed in, in doing that, and I urge you to do it if you have the time. How does God assess the value of human life? In Genesis chapter 1, he affirmed the worth of every human being. Most people acknowledge the value of human life, but we don't all agree on what that means or whom it includes. Our culture is divided over the worth of unborn children, elderly individuals, and those who can't support or care for themselves. Others deem some lives are not valuable. 
which is reflected in racism, discrimination, and murder. God values all human life, and he makes no exceptions. He expects us to value life as he does. Now the setting here to bring us up to speed. Excuse me here a minute. I use an ink pen to point sometimes so I don't lose my place where I'm reading from. And I forgot to pick that up this morning. At Mount Sinai, the Lord initiated a covenant with the Israelites. And the heart of that covenant consists of the Ten Commandments. This session focuses on the sixth commandment, do not murder. The account of David sparing Saul's life, recorded in 1 Samuel 26, illustrates obedience to this command. After the Israelites wandered 40 years because of their unfaithfulness to the Lord, Joshua led the new generation into Canaan. The Israelites remained faithful to the Lord during Joshua's lifetime. And that we're talking about in Judges chapter 2, verse 7. Not long after Joshua's death, the nation entered a dark period recorded in the book of Judges. Samuel functioned as the last of the judges and also as kingmaker, priests, and prophet. First Samuel begins with the record of this leader's birth in First Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord's calling of young Samuel to serve him appears in chapter 3. The failure of Samuel's sons to emulate their father's faithfulness to the Lord contributed to Israel's demand for a king in chapter 8. The Lord told Samuel to grant the people's request and emphasized that they had rejected the Lord as their king in verse 7. At the Lord's direction, Samuel privately anointed Saul as Israel's first king in chapter 10. Later, Saul was presented to the people of Israel as their king at Mizpah. Saul then exercised his authority as king, rallied the Israelites, and defeated the Ammonites. The new king's action on this occasion confirms his competence to lead. And that's talked about in chapter 11. After beginning well, Saul made a series of foolish decisions. Because he failed to obey the Lord, God rejected him as king in chapter 15. In contrast, after his anointing, David repeatedly demonstrated courage and dependence on the Lord. Although Saul attempted to murder David on more than one occasion, David spared Saul's life out of respect for him as the Lord's anointed. The first verse that we'll talk about here this morning uh, thou shalt not kill in uh, Exodus 20 verse 13 this commandment falls into the latter section of the ten commandments dealing with people's relations with one another the Hebrew language possesses two ways of expressing a negative command depending on whether it's a mild or a strong prohibition. The Lord employed the form denoting strong prohibition when he issued the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. 
The specific uh, Hebrew verb translated murder refers to putting to death wrongly for selfish reasons. It does not denote putting to death with authorization as in the administration of justice in Israel or killing in divinely ordered holy war. In the Old Testament, the Lord delegated to his covenant community Israel the right to take a human life by his command, either through capital punishment laws or through his instructions regarding holy war. No individual Israelite possessed the right to act on his own and decide to end another person's life. The concept of premeditated, of premeditation and deliberateness lies at the heart of the verb rendered murder in this commandment. To destroy another human being is to destroy the crowning point or pinnacle of God's creation. That's talked about in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. No wonder the Lord commands his people to love their neighbors. Murder begins in the heart as hatred, the opposite of love. The words the Lord addressed to the Israelites at Mount Sinai, were well known, or words as we know, as the Ten Commandments, were essentially words of freedom. The Lord introduced them by identifying himself as the one who had secured his people by uh, freedom by bringing them out of the land of Egypt and out of the place of slavery in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. Their freedom, however, possessed some limitations. It involved responsibility for others' welfare. Freedom under the covenant meant others had certain unalienable rights that could not be violated without the offender experiencing negative consequences. The sin of murder had violated the sacredness of human life from the beginning of time when Cain murdered his brother Abel in Genesis chapter 4. When God made a covenant with Noah after the flood, he prohibited murder. The sixth commandment forbids murder. Jesus taught that murder begins with anger and hatred in the heart. Thus from Genesis forward the scriptures teach sacredness of and respect for human life what's some of the lasting truths of uh, this verse we need to value human life because God values it we need to value human life because God created every person in his image We are not to destroy another life through hate or defamation. We need to value human life because the scripture teaches that human life is sacred. In chapter 26, verses 7 through 11, we'll read these verses. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now, therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. And David said to Abishai, 
destroy him not? For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. And in verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. Human life is precious to God and it should be precious to us. Yet we often give in to the false notion that just because we don't take part in a physical murder uh, ourselves, we are above this four word command, thou shalt not kill. Jesus made it clear in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount that murder can take other forms. We also have, are not to destroy another's life through hate or defamation. And we talked about that you can murder someone, you can kill someone with, their, with your words uh, spoken uh, to destroy their spirit, uh, harm them in that way. And that, that's another form of murder that Jesus was talking about. Christ has called us to live a life of love when you and I live absent of love for God and one another, we are living in disobedience to God's highest command to love. Yet love becomes difficult to experience in the stench of unforgiveness. Kind words become biting criticisms. Giving gestures begin to be tied to demands in return. The debris of rotting regret, shame, anger, and doubt flood the air, producing difficulties in relationships, careers, ministry, and virtually every other sphere of life. That's why finding the ability to forgive is about so much more than forgiving the person who hurt you or even forgiving yourself for what you now regret. It's also about regaining the life God intends uh, for you. We respect God's authority over life by acknowledging it. Saul's animosity toward David began as jealousy that grew in intensity over time. Their relationship began on a positive note when Saul selected David to play the liar for him and to serve as his armor bearer. That's talked about in uh, chapter 16. After David killed Goliath, and demonstrated his proficiency in battle, the young David began to receive more accolades from the people than Saul did, and Saul was jealous. Saul began to watch David. He was jealous. I think he had a notion that he's going to take the kingdom from me. He, David had a following. And Saul was afraid of losing his position of power. More than once, Saul attempted to pin David to the wall with a spear in chapters 18 and chapter 19. Other times he tried unsuccessfully to cause David's death in battle with the Philistines in chapter 18. He would send David into battle and require of him unspeakable things for him to bring back uh, 54 skins uh, from the Philistines 
and in these passages in chapter 18 and uh, verses 12 through 30. David brought back a hundred to Saul. The Saul was all the time trying to put him in harm's way uh, if he could. But during this time that Saul began watching David, David became a man on the run. He fled to Nob where he lied to the priest Ahimelech in order to get food and Goliath's sword in chapter 21. That deception later cost the lives of Nob's priests and only Abathar escaped, and that's in chapter 22. 1 Samuel 23 exhibits David's concern for human life as he rescued the city of Keilah inhabitants from a Philistine attack. Saul continues to pursue David, but the Lord protected his servant. Once Saul took 3,000 men to track Dave, David down in the region of En Gedi. And that's where Saul went into the cave where David and his 600 men were hiding. David cut, cut off part of Saul's garment and later uh, showed it to him to let him know just how close that he came that David could have took his life had he chosen. In chapter 25, David spares the life of foolish Nabal and his men thanks to Abigail, Abigail's intervention. As 20, chapter 26 opens, David and his men are hiding in the wilderness of Ziph. Accompanied by 3,000 men, Saul goes out to search for David. David sends out spies to find out where their encampment is. David takes Abishai, his uh, nephew, and uh, enters Saul's camp after nightfall. That uh, Saul lay asleep in the midst of his troops when David enters the camp. Now, although sleep can provide refreshment, it can also enable an opponent, an opponent to gain the advantage. In this instance, no one woke up. And you may wonder, well, how is that possible? It's because a deep sleep from the Lord came over them. Chapter or, uh, 26, verse 12. Saul lay in the inner circle that he was surrounded by all of his men. Their equipment and their animals were on the outer fringe of their uh, area. Saul laid in the middle where it would probably have been the safest uh, place for him. He had positioned his spear where he could grab it quickly in an emergency. He had stuck it in the ground near his head. The Hebrew word for spear designates a lethal weapon, short in length, and capable of being thrown. This was Saul's personal weapon. It symbolized his royalty, and it also symbolized his power. Jealous because of David's popularity, Saul had used such a spear in trying to pin David to the wall in chapter 18. You can see that Saul, he's a hothead. And how can David not go ahead and take him out to protect his own life? David chose to rely on the Lord and trust in God or for deliverance. The king had taken thorough measures for his protection. Abner uh, rested nearby. The role of hunter and hunted, the role becomes reversed in this instant. Because of the Lord's intervention, Saul could have easily 
become David's prey. David would succeed. His success would come in the Lord's timing. David nobly refused to seize the throne violently because if he were to do so and kill Saul, who's to say that someone wouldn't do the same to him? Abishai is one of David's select warriors, I believe, because he's mentioned again in chapter uh, 19. He was more than willing and more than able to stand up for David in any situation and ready to do David's bidding. Abishai believed the circumstances here indicated that God had handed Saul over to David. And Abishai further identifies Saul as David's enemy. In the Old Testament thought, the enemies of God's people typically were viewed as God's enemies also. Elsewhere, the defeat of David's enemies signified God's favor on him. And that's in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and in verses 22. Abishai advised that Saul be killed immediately and volunteered to perform the act. Quick action, not restraint, characterized Abishai. Sometimes does that characterize us? Someone wrongs us. Someone angers us. We're quick to take action or retaliate. We don't want to be like Abishai. We want to be like David and trust God. And through our relationship with God, we understand his sovereignty over uh, circumstances. And we allow him to work out his plan. And if he is going to do something to that person, then it be in God's time and in his will to do so. Abishai felt confidence of his own strength and skill. He could kill Saul with one blow. But David counters with no one could lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and be innocent. Saul had repeatedly demonstrated his unfitness to rule by disobeying the Lord and his commands. Nevertheless, the king remained the Lord's anointed. Saul had been set aside uh, for God's service. And second, although a priest or a prophet might serve as the agent of anointing, anointing individuals are identified as those whom the Lord has anointed. Divine enabling comes accompanied the anointing. Finally, the noun form of the verb becomes associated with the coming promised deliverer, Jesus. And we translate that into English as Messiah and the Greek form for Christ. David's words recorded in 1 Samuel 26.10 reveal his determination to leave vengeance where it belongs in the Lord's hands. The events surrounding Nabal's death had previously confirmed, confirmed for David the Lord's sovereignty in matters of judgment. And you can see how Nabal was struck dead after a heart attack that he had, that the Lord put on him. And I think he lived 10 days and then died in chapter 25. The remainder of verse 10 enumerates two possibilities for Saul's demise. Either his day will come and he will die, or he will go into uh, battle and perish. 
in any case, David affirms that the sovereign Lord remained in control whether uh, Saul died through violent or nonviolent means. That the Lord had standed, handed Saul over to him, David refused to harm the Lord's anointed. David had passed this test from the time Saul, Samuel anointed this young son of Jesse He knew the Lord had chosen him as Israel's next king. Yet David chose to await God's timing. Although Saul repeatedly acted as David's enemy, David continued to value the king's life. David's expression, I consider your life valuable, can more literally be translated Your life was great in my eyes. David expressed his desire to receive recompense in kind for sparing Saul's life. However, he did not expect that reward or deliverance to come from Saul. Rather, Israel's future king prayed that may the Lord consider my life valuable and rescue me from all trouble. Uh, David expected that deliverance from trouble like regard for the value of his life would come from the Lord not from Saul who had been a major source of trouble for David trouble is derived from a verb meaning to bind or to be narrow or to be in distress it can refer to anything narrow and signifies being restricted or confined. In his last recorded words to David, Saul not only declared declared David blessed, but also asserted that Israel's future king would do great things and prevail. Blessed means to kneel. And the connection between the two meanings may lie in association uh, kneeling with receiving a blessing in the Old Testament. To bless someone meant to endow them with power to accomplish a purpose. Furthermore, Saul knew David would prevail. David prevailed with a sling and a stone against uh, Goliath. The shepherd would continue to prevail because of his relationship with the Lord. David's prevailing would include his succeeding Saul as king of Israel. By this point in time, Saul apparently recognized that reality. David learned to leave vindication to the Lord. Although he had opportunity on more than one occasion to kill Saul, David refused to do so. As his followers, Christ expects us to live faithfully before him. And in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus took the sixth commandment to a deeper level. He broadened its application to encompass wrongful anger that could lead to literal murder. Jesus included cutting hurtful words that can kill or destroy a person's spirit. Christ instructed us to value every aspect of others' well-being and to treat them in keeping with this valuation. In so doing, we will honor life. We respect life by refusing to return evil for evil. We respect life by leaving vindication to the Lord. We respect life by treating every life as equally valuable. And we respect life by valuing every aspect of others.
well-being. Let's read a couple more verses here. I'll try not to get so long-winded. In verses 22 through 25, And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou my son, David. Thou shalt both do great things and also shalt prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. David noted that the king's missing spear and water jug. The spear uh, is representative of Saul's power and authority and the water jug and the contents of the water represents his life. When David and Abishai went into the camp and took those things, David literally had Saul's power and authority in his life in his hands, but chose not to, uh, to slay Saul. David had also learned not to trust Saul's words so there would be no reconciliation that day in chapter 20 or verse 22. He has one of Saul's young men come and retrieve the spear. To render means to pay back or to uh, return or restore. Uh, Righteousness used here means right behavior based on God's uh, standards, especially in human relationship. The human word for faithfulness uh, we're talking about in chapter verse 23 here now uh, is used in Exodus chapter 17 verse 12 to describe the steadiness of Moses' hands when Aaron and Hur supported them during Israel's battle with the Amalekites. As David used the word, it can picture someone who supports or upholds what God has said, who is faithful or loyal to the Lord and to his covenant stipulations. With these words, David declared he was innocent of any wrongdoing related to Saul. David recognized that favorable circumstances in his eyes, such as when the Lord handed Saul over to him, did not constitute permission to kill Saul. God alone had authority over human life. He would be the one to decree if or when a life would be taken. And that's why David did not stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed. David did mess up in 2 Samuel, in chapter 11, verse, in chapter 12, where he had Uriah the Hittite sent into battle and uh, he was killed to help cover up his uh, adultery with Bathsheba. David was guilty of murder there, and he did pay the consequences uh, of that. In asserting his innocence, in this uh, case, David essentially highlights Saul's guilt. Saul had not done right, as he had confessed, nor had he been loyal to God's covenant demands. Thus he too would ultimately receive his due from the Lord 
for his sinful actions. David didn't ask the king to stop chasing and trying to kill him. In fact, he expected it to continue. But what was likely the last words he ever spoke to Saul, and remember now Saul was his father-in-law and the king of Israel, David made a request of God that God would treat him as he had treated Saul. David had considered Saul's life valuable. David didn't presume upon God, but he knew that the Lord respected human life and thus asked God to value his life. David also asked the Lord to deliver me out of all tribulation. And that's more than wishful thinking. It was confidence in the Lord's character and ability which David had known throughout his life. As a youth, he asserted to King Saul when he went to fight against Goliath. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And that's in chapter 17, verse uh, 37. Every single life bears the stamp of God's, bears the stamp of God. Granted, we have marred that image through our sinfulness, but his image is stamped in each of us. This reality gives life its value. This truth ought to dictate not only how we view and treat ourselves, but also how we view and treat others. We are to respect life by treating every life as equally valuable. David modeled this in his interaction with Saul. Saul had a momentary heart change. He called David his son and spoke of great things that David would would go on to accomplish. In fact, David's refusal to kill Saul when he had the chance encouraged Saul to return home and stop the chase, at least for the time being. There's one more little uh, piece of information I want to share with you here. It's at the very end of your uh, lesson book David displayed an attitude that valued life throughout his life David modeled words the prophet Micah would speak centuries later he hath showed thee O man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God Micah chapter 6 verse 8 consider how we can live out this truth even as David did and how we honor all of life to act justly includes acting justly toward the innocent and vulnerable and seeking to protect their lives. To love mercy involves consistently and faithfully pursuing life and liberty for those who are at risk of losing both. To walk humbly requires that we esteem others better than ourselves. When we do these things, we will both honor and value life as God intended for us to do. We will also position ourselves for the blessings and rewards that come from doing so, as we witnessed in David's own situation with Saul. As Saul said, Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt both do great things and also shalt prevail. Thank you once again for your attention this morning. May God bless your home, your family, and 
Uh, please try to come to church if you can. Thank you.